Good afternoon. Warmly welcome you, all of you, to the first forum, which is part of the IPS online series. This is a regular virtual series which will discuss issues related to Singapore's governance, economy, society, and culture. Uh, over the course of the next few weeks, my colleagues and I will be engaging you with a number of interesting sessions. So we welcome you to join in for those discussions. If you haven't already done so, uh, I invite you to take part of the online poll about today's topic, which we sent out before this event. Uh, we're using the OP platform. If you're on Facebook Live, you can find that in the comment section. You can also see the link on our event banner. Our event has been oversubscribed. Thank you for that overwhelming response. Those who couldn't be registered uh, have been invited to view it on Facebook Live. So if you are joining us from Facebook Live, thank you for coming on. Uh, we are allowing questions uh, by using, you can do that by using the Q&A function on Zoom. I will also be collating some questions from Facebook. You can put in your questions at any time. Uh, we invite yourself to, we invite you to identify yourself when you ask your question. So we can perhaps hear more from you. If you want to clarify, we can do that. So name and organization, uh, the organization you represent, that'd be great. Let me just quickly go through some basic housekeeping announcements. Uh, all the microphones have been put to mute. And uh, we do have media who, are, who is covering this event and that uh, will be recorded as well. Uh, the recording will be uploaded on IPS website and Facebook page later. Uh, we're planning for the session to be for, or we plan for it to be for an hour, but there's a chance that we are going to overrun uh, based on the capacity of our panelists and participants. So if we do, then bear with us uh, as we overrun a little bit. Without further ado, let me uh, come to the topic of the day. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in the issue of migrant workers recently. In fact, we had to close registration this forum less than a day after we sent out invites because of how important this topic is to so many people. Uh, IPS has in the past had roundtables on migrant workers, whether it was their living conditions or the numbers that are necessary for our current economic model. This time we're discussing these issues with our media headlines. Nearly every day for a good long month have been featuring what is happening to our worker dorms around the island. Uh, in fact, if I can get the next slide, outbreak of the virus has practically dominated our local media headlines. And if you look at the headlines, the headlines that note the high number of COVID-19 infections and in dorms, uh, efforts to contain the spread, such as stay-at-home notices, the effect the infections had created on the construction industry, the broader economy, and also government efforts to raise standards of dormitories which are now regarded as either not being well enforced or the standards were not up to mark to start off with. The international media has also put some spotlight on this issue. Uh, some have used this as a lesson to show how difficult it is to be on top of the virus, that even a model coronavirus response does not have complete success. And of course, others have used it to show that there's a need to take care of all the weak links in society. We've also in recent weeks heard of the many measures to deal with the virus among the migrant worker community. So that's ramping up on testing, uh, separating healthy workers and putting them in separate venues, and the many measures to better their conditions. Uh, obviously, there have been some feeding problems in this and rehousing migrant workers, but you also hear about the different efforts, whether it's uh, food tasting to make sure that the food catered to the workers are acceptable, Wi-Fi provision, many uh, different kinds of language, uh, movies, other ways to make life a little bit more bearable. Of course, what has happened has also led to a bit of questioning on our overall manpower strategy to accommodate migrant workers. Uh, there have been concerns in not treating workers as a first world country should, especially if you look at the cramped conditions that are sometimes uh, found in some uh, dormitories, especially factory dormitories, for instance. Uh, I mean, many people are now concerned about these issues, but for migrant workers, they've been living through some of these conditions for some time. We also see from the uh, coverage of uh, reports of how we as a society, uh, we may not have treated migrants the way they did, the, the, with the proper respect they deserve. But we also see Singaporeans now stepping up very proactive 
finding ways to contribute to the welfare of migrants, whether it's doctors volunteering or Singaporeans donating to help migrant workers who have been uh, affected, the great community efforts that we see around. So in this forum, uh, we're trying to ponder at both the policy responses that have been put together by the interagency task force to deal with the rise of infections among our migrant worker population. We're also looking at the longer term lessons which are bearing for manpower and economic strategies. Are they adequate to address the needs, the safety, the health of the migrant worker? Uh, how can, our, whether it's the dorm operators, employers, NGOs, government agencies, how they can they come together to address those needs better? We also need to think about the issues that have surfaced because of the high number of infections. Uh, what can we say about the general uh, conditions, and living conditions of migrant workers? Uh, can more be done? Uh, if you look at uh, MOM's policies for the care of the migrant worker, there are many issues that have been addressed over the years, everything from legislation to ensure that employment agents don't charge too much, workers are paid properly, uh, proper accommodation, uh, that workers obtain medical attention, uh, medical leave when they need it. Uh, they even have a right to change employers under certain circumstances. So the question that still needs to be discussed is whether we have sufficient policy and just as important, do we have sufficient enforcement of these policies to ensure the well-being of the workers? And even the broader questions have to do with the model that we use when it comes to running our economy, the large number of migrant workers, something like 725,000 migrant workers on work passes, don't include the domestic workers. Uh, of these uh, 700,000 or so workers, 40% of them are in the construction industry. And the model is one where they're differentiated. So there are different kinds of benefits between our local Singaporean workers, uh, migrant workers. So the big question to ask, is this all tenable for the long-term future? So to help us today, we've got three experts who are going to be speaking to you. Uh, Associate Professor uh, Jeremy Lim, Associate Professor Walter Tessera, and Mr. Bernard Menon. After we hear from them, we'll have three discussants uh, who will we'll come on later on. Professor Pauline Strawn, uh, Professor Eugene Tan and Mr. Len Lim, and they will engage the panel a little bit and uh, they also share their thoughts. And after that, we'll be taking questions uh, from everyone and we'll be compiling them and asking the panelists. So let's start uh, first by from hearing from uh, Professor Jeremy Lim. Uh, he's Associate Professor and Co-Director of Global Health at South Week School of Public Health at NUS. He's also the Co-Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Amelia, the first dedicated gut uh, microbiome full service company in Southeast Asia. Uh, Jeremy, one, I mean, Jeremy also serves in Health Surf, he's on the board there, and so he is well acquainted with some of the issues that our migrant community faces. So over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Matthew, and a very good afternoon to all of you. And I'm, and I'm really gratified that this is an oversubscribed event because as Matthew pointed out, it really signals the attention and hopefully the commitment to make enduring change moving forward. Uh, I've been asked to share a little about the public health responses and I'll, and I'll, and I'll focus uh, mainly on, on the public health uh, really response, but bearing in mind that, that it's all intertwined and it's a very integrated approach. Can I go to the next slide, please? And the first thing I would like to note, and these are yesterday's cases, we don't need to bother about the specific numbers, but, but what I wanted to highlight was that uh, since the migrant worker and the, and the dormitory situation erupted, the government has elected to separate out the number of cases. And with, and with ministers are clearly highlighting that we're dealing with two outbreaks. Uh, this is defensible from a public health point of view because there are different strategies, but clearly it does inadvertently also seek uh, uh, also further marginalize and, and already marginalize and vulnerable population. But of course, it does illustrate very clearly that the circuit breaker measures for the community have been successful and we define the community very artificially here as in everyone other than a work permit holder who is inside or outside a dormitory. But uh, if we look at the uh, axis, it's also very clear that the bulk of the, of, the, of the public health challenge remains amongst the dormitory residents. Next slide, please. Right, so why have we come here? And 
really perhaps to look at the policy response, we need to go back a little bit to the, to the pre-COVID times where to sum it up in a, in a nutshell, um, the pre-COVID-19 arrangements have all been about employers. And, and in theory, uh, migrant workers have it very good from a healthcare point of view. The employers are supposed to fully fund healthcare and every migrant worker is, and every work, and every work permit holder is required by law to have some modicum of insurance that covers for hospitalization. However, the theory looks really good, but the practice is, is really quite different because of the power dynamics, because of the financial constraints, and because uh, workers really don't want the employers to know that they have a chronic disease or anything like that because they are afraid of having their work permits cancelled and, and then they have to go back to their home countries at very short notice. And in practice, what then happens and what we see over in HealthServe also is that many workers, in particular those who have chronic diseases such as high blood pressure, tend to pay for it themselves without claiming the reimbursement from their employers, even though they are legally permitted to do so. Uh, next slide, please. Right. And of course, if we apply the mental model that, that the migrant worker, the work permit holders, um, healthcare, uh, um, issues are the responsibility of the employers. Then as we stream and then as we transition into COVID-19, it is very clear that the MOM's responses have been entirely consistent, right? And as Minister Josephine Teo pointed out, uh, really what they had done was to inform the dorm operators to be more vigilant, to step up hygiene. They have also informed the dorm operators to inform the workers and everything has been really the MOM more as a policy unit issuing directives, issuing guidance rather than looking and saying this is our responsibility. Right? And what in practice we have since discovered also is that the dorm operators have had difficulties uh, um, even sticking to the, to the existing regulatory framework. I think that in the, the newspapers just two days ago, it was announced that half of DOM op operators uh, had, had been fined for flouting the licensing con, uh, for, for really flouting licensing terms previously, uh, really every year. And this had been a consistent pattern for a number of years. Uh, next slide, please. So as we move into COVID-19, uh, and as it became clear that the dorm operators and the employers were absolutely overwhelmed with the, with the additional measures needed in terms of safe distancing, in terms of uh, wearing of masks and, and, and really so on. And everything just fell apart and the government had no choice but to then step in. And really to the government's credit, it quickly pivoted away from this mental model that is the employer's issue and not the government's issue. And it then came in to take over, right? And it became very clear that, that the dormitory issues were of such a magnitude that a civilian outfit was not able to manage adequately and the military and the police were also subsequently called it. And if you have not read, uh, please do read the very detailed media release uh, that was issued on Labor Day, which really describes in a, lot, in a lot of detail what the government has been doing for the for the migrant workers both inside and outside dormitories. And the little graphic that's on the right hand side really uh, highlights what is the care model. And that's the last point that I wanted to really raise that that early on in the COVID-19 outbreak, the care model was really that every patient needs to be isolated in a hospital setting. But as the sheer numbers grew, the model has also changed. And reading between the lines of the, of the first May uh, really media release, it's also very clear that there is, an, that there is a multi-echelon uh, care, care model where the sickest of the workers, who are very, very few, would go to a hospital, go to a restructured, uh, either the NCID or to one of the restructured hospitals, and they would get care that's no different from any other Singaporean. But the vast majority of the workers are very well, and the government, I guess, had decided that, it, that we just don't have the facilities to manage them uh, in the other, in the 
in the previously standard way, putting those who needed uh, uh, quarantine to be in hotels and really so on. And so these two new echelons, a community care facility, which currently is the Expo and the Changi Exhibition Center, as well as another facility over in Changi, uh, caters to persons uh, who, who are COVID positive and have mild symptoms. And after they have been housed in, the, in a community care facility for a number of, of days, they would then be moved to another new term, a community recovery facility. And, and what the first May media release clearly articulates is that both the CCF and, and the CRFs can also exist within dormitories. So I would suspect that moving forward for many of the migrant workers, they would be diagnosed inside the dormitory they would then be moved within the dormitory into a community care facility that is on site within the dorm. And after a couple of days, when they have been declared uh, that they're no longer clinically worried, they then move to a CRF, which is also within the dorm. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so if I can sum up where we are in terms of policy response, the policy responses have been guided by the mental models. And the mental model that we have traditionally taken is that the migrant workers are part of the community, but they are separate. And we accept that there should be different standards. Right? Uh, it's been clear that the previous mental, that the previous paradigm of relying on the employers and the dorm operators just cannot work in a crisis of the scale of the complexity. And we have accepted that there is a two-tier model for the migrant workers moving forward. It is clinically defensible and credit to the government that we have spent lots and lots of money on the migrant workers who have been quite ill, needing to spend a lot of time within the ICU, chalking up bills of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And in sympathy with so many uh, positive workers, the options are extremely limited given the sheer numbers and also that this is a population that's almost totally dependent on really state funding. But the question we then have to pose is, if these were not migrant workers, if they were all Singaporeans, would we have rolled out the same plan? Right? And really, I keep coming back to policy changes will be driven by the mental models that really underlie all these policy changes. And on this note, I will hand the time back to you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thanks for prodding us a little bit about that issue uh, and the, the health issues about this. We, we're turning now to look at, uh, to hear from uh, Mr. Bernard Menon. Uh, Mr. Bernard Menon will talk a little bit more about what's going on, on the ground. He's director, uh, migrant worker segment at, for NTUC and concurrently executive director of Migr Migrant Worker Center. Uh, initiative led by NTUC and in partnership with SNEF. Uh, Bernard is trained in both law and public administration and has had over 23 years uh, working with the migrant population. So over to you, Bernard. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, so uh, I realize I'm on a bit of a tight schedule here, so I'm going to try and quickly uh, fly through what we do uh, in peacetime. Uh, prior to COVID. So the, the MWC has been around now for about 11, 12 years. Uh, we operate much like any other migrant worker NGO. Uh, we do a lot of work on engagement. Um, we engage both uh, foreign workers and also uh, locals on social integration uh, issues. And also we try to uh, raise awareness uh, among, among many migrant worker communities about their employment uh, uh, rights uh, and entitlements uh, as granted to them by the law. <clears throat> um, the other big chunk of work we do uh, over the years, and I feel basically this is the part that's most important to us, is the casework. So we actually do casework, case uh, representation, case advocacy um, for individual migrant workers that have problems, uh, salary claims, injury claims, uh, housing complaints, uh, and any other uh, issues that plague them uh, during their tenure of employment in Singapore. <clears throat> Uh, connected to that, we also provide shelter uh, and food provision service, uh, food provision services for uh, migrant workers that may have been uh, uh, abandoned by their employers. Uh, okay, so um, over the years, um, through just doing this casework, uh, part of our jobs, um, we've also begun to uh, um, find it necessary to, uh, from time to time, come out and 
advocate for certain things that we have learned through the course of helping migrant workers through their cases um, that may be you know, uh, uh, problems with uh, the system, whether it's the dispute resolution system or maybe just the protections uh, in the laws granted to the migrant workers. So some of the things we've advocated for quite strongly over the years uh, include uh, salary pay slips, um, uh, key contract terms uh, for the employment. Uh, and in fact, these um, prior to 2016 were, were not present, uh, not for migrant workers, nor for Singaporeans. Uh, so in 2016, an uh, amendment was made to the Employment Act. And since then, um, basically all uh, new employees upon joining a company uh, will have to be issued within 14 days of employment, um, a document for their own safekeeping, uh, denoting the key contract terms um, of the employment, uh, which would mean salary, uh, the amount of leave they have, the amount of medical leave they have, key uh, terms like that. The other change that was made in 2016 uh, involves the issuance of salary slips. So from 2016 onwards, uh, every time uh, any employee in Singapore is issued salary, uh, it must be accompanied with a, a written pay slip, uh, uh, setting out how the salary, uh, various sal salary components are calculated. And this document is to be issued to the worker for his own safekeeping too. We've actually gone a little bit beyond that uh, and over the years have advocated quite strongly for electronic payment um, to become uh, mandated, uh, mandatory uh, for uh, work permit holders. What we do understand is today, um, around 75 to 85%, we don't exactly know the exact number, but 75 to 85% of our uh, migrant worker population are already paid electronically. Um, so basically, we just have the last gap to close and uh, I think uh, one of the things that uh, COVID-19 experience has actually helped to do is to uh, uh, make very clear to all the stakeholders uh, what benefits uh, there is to um, actually making uh, uh, electronic banking of salaries compulsory for migrant workers. Um, over the years, we've also advocated quite strongly for uh, housing standards. Um, one of the uh, things we did do is uh, upon the enactment of the Foreign Employee Dormitories Act in 2015, we actually advocated uh, uh, for the smaller dormitories uh, to also be included in the coverage of the law. Um, FIDA has a, a, a threshold of a, a thousand uh, bids and above. So uh, the regulations actually apply uh, completely to big dormitories but not uh, across the board to the, the, the dorms that are that house below a thousand workers. One of the other things we've done is we've accumulated a, a core of uh, ambassadors, about 5,000 ambassadors. Uh, these are migrant workers themselves and they live in the dormitories. Um, in peacetime, uh, they would help us ground sense, disseminate important information or laws, uh, and also mobilize the ground for our engagements and events. Um, but also during COVID-19, I think uh, uh, the authorities have found that they've come in uh, extra helpful uh, in trying to stabilize the situation in the large dorms. Uh, so these guys will, uh, these ambassadors of ours will also help them to try and, uh, uh, you know, uh, do everything in terms of advising the fellow workers uh, to maybe even helping with, uh, some of the, 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 the heavy lifting, like, you know, distributing of meals in the early days. Um, one last thing I want to add is that uh, in the last two to three years, we've actually partnered with the Tripartite Alliance uh, for Dispute Management, which is the statutory recovery process for employment claims. Um, and in situations, especially uh, where salary arrears claims, uh, where employers are unable uh, to make good on the uh, salary claim orders uh, that are made by uh, uh, the, the Tripartite Alliance, um, basically what uh, we do is our charity comes in uh, and tries to um, regularize the situation by making extra uh, payments uh, to these unsuccessful claimants. Um, the number has not been large, um, but it's pretty important for the sake of this discussion. Okay, sorry, very quickly. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were briefing our ambassadors. We were trying to get everybody ready uh, because we, we predicted that a situation like this might occur. And if it were to occur, the ambassadors within the dormitories would be key resources, uh, not only to us, but also to the authorities uh, to try and help assure the ground and to make sure that um, the workers were, were okay and also to 
provide feedback uh, uh, to the government authorities that will be running the show. Um, currently, uh, we're, we're well into the lockdown, and um, what we've diverted our attention to is providing uh, essential support for the workers in the dormitories. So this would include essential items for personal hygiene, personal care, sanitizers, uh, bath soap, uh, laundry detergent, uh, toothbrush, toothpaste, any essential items that now the workers in the dorms who are unable to come out uh, uh, don't have the, the resources to purchase. Um, so what we've done is we've tried to target this problem at scale. And um, when we do provide, uh, what we do is we try and aggregate through donations or in-kind donations uh, enough to serve uh, all the purpose-built dormitories and or all the factory converted dormitories. Um, I'll move very quickly to what we think uh, is gonna happen post circuit breaker. Um, we know that there are many relocation center centers now set up and uh, we're also trying to get a sense of what their needs are in terms of essential uh, supplies to see if we can service them too. But beyond that, I think uh, one of the things that uh, people are expecting is uh, come June, July, uh, we know that um, uh, this two month uh, break has uh, uh, caused a lot of strain on a lot of businesses. And we quite expect that there would be a surge uh, in the number of migrant worker layoffs uh, and also salary claims. So uh, like I said earlier, how we support the Tripartite Alliance with the uh, Ex-Russia uh, uh, payments uh, to workers who are unsuccessful with claims. We are also trying to put, uh, uh, gather our ammunition together uh, in preparation for a, a surge of uh, uh, employment and salary claims um, um, come maybe starting from June. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's it. I don't have any slides. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard, for sharing uh, what MWC is doing and also all the different things you're anticipating post-COVID. Uh, we'll hear more from you about what uh, exactly migrant workers are feeling on the ground uh, later on during the panel discussion. Our third panelist is uh, Walter Tessera. He is Associate Professor of Economics, School of Business at uh, Singapore University of Social Sciences. He's also a nominated member of Parliament. Uh, Walter, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so I've got some slides. Let me just put them up. Okay, so I think I, I'd like to, to start by thinking about this problem we're trying to solve, right? So we're all concerned about uh, many of the deficiencies um, in which migrant workers are being treated in Singapore. But I think to do something about it, we need to understand a few things. And I don't have a lot of answers, but I think these are the questions we need to understand. Okay, so the questions are, um, how large is the economic value generated by migrant workers in Singapore? Uh, the reason why you want to ask this is you need to have some idea of how big uh, the economic pie is that has to be split. Because if you want to improve welfare wages or whatever, there has to be enough uh, underlying value generated. But, you know, we need to know something more about this. Um, and related issue, of course, is how has migrant uh, labor affected the Singapore economy? Okay, we also want to understand a bit more about why this value at present uh, doesn't actually go to the migrant worker, okay? In other words, why does it not uh, flow through in higher wages, working conditions, whatever? And given all of this, what can we do about that, okay? All right, so let me just go through a couple of basic facts first. So, um, you know, as of 2019, you have a foreign uh, workforce of about 1.4 million in Singapore, and that's about 38% of the entire labor force in Singapore. And actually, most non-residents in Singapore are uh, foreign workers of one type or another. Uh, migrant workers are the majority of this foreign workforce. So uh, higher skilled workers are relatively uh, few, right? So you have maybe about uh, 200,000 employment pass, another 200,000 S pass, but the most of them are what people consider migrant workers, which is uh, basically lower wage uh, workers. And of course, we know that COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting the migrant workers in group uh, quarters or living areas. Okay, so um, if you take a, you know, a bit of a step back and you look at Singapore's uh, labor market over the last 50 years or so, you will actually see that uh, the Singapore economy has become a lot more reliant on foreign labor um, over time. Okay, so just after independence, maybe only less than 10% or so of the labor force is actually non-resident. This is only a very rough estimate, by the way. These numbers are not likely to be completely accurate because they're based on rough estimates. Um, there's not a lot of data on foreign labor force in the past, you see. But anyway, when you go from 1970 to 
pretty much almost the present day, you see that now we're close to a 40% uh, dependence in the labor force on foreign uh, on non-resident labor. Uh, so that's actually a huge change. I mean, I think the average Singaporean working in Singapore 40 years ago wouldn't recognize uh, how dependent, you know, I mean, the experience of how dependent we are on foreign labor would be completely different. Okay. All right, so um, from an economic perspective, what is the difference between foreign and local labor? I mean, there might be compositional differences, okay? By then, I mean, you know, they may have different skills, they may be of different age or demographics in the local population. What's important here is it's always easier to buy rather than make. In other words, if I need 10,000 workers of a certain age group and a certain skill set, it's always easier for me to buy them or import them from somewhere else than it is for me to create them domestically, okay? Why? Because the domestic labor force increases incredibly slowly. Unemployment is very low in Singapore. There are not that many people out of the labor force. So I cannot find 500, 1,000, whatever workers in the local labor force. I have to get them from elsewhere. So that's a key uh, issue that we have to understand. The other difference between foreign and local labor is institutional or policy reasons. Uh, there's a cost structure difference because foreign workers generally accept lower wages. Of course, there's also foreign worker levy and quota, which is the other side of the issue. And there are labor regulatory differences, right? It's easier for employers to fire foreign workers, but employers are also made responsible for their welfare. But in general, employers have more control over foreign labor. Okay, so that's uh, quite important. So the reason why I mentioned this uh, compositional versus policy or institutional reasons, that's important because generally we might think that getting foreign workers because we need them to address a compositional gap in the local labor force, that could be efficiency, efficiency enhancing. But getting them, you know, just because they are cheaper or because you can mistreat them or something, I not so, I'm not so sure that that would improve the efficiency of the uh, Singapore economy. That's something we have to consider. Okay, so who benefits and why? Actually, pretty much everybody in Singapore benefits. I'm going to take the simplistic view that migrant worker labor reduces the cost of anything which is low to medium scale and labor intensive in Singapore. And this is really important because we don't have a lot of growth in the lo local labor force. And in particular, the local labor force has become much more skilled over the last 50 years or so. So uh, without a large supply of migrant worker labor and the increasing share in the labor force, we would have actually have a lot of difficulty uh, providing the level and the price of goods and services that Singaporeans are accustomed to today. Okay, so in general, most of us benefit. If you happen to be a Singaporean who competes with foreign labor and generally in a low to medium skilled jobs, you won't benefit unless policy corrects this. For example, you could say that the uh, DRC quota forces employers to hire and keep Singaporeans. So in that sense, you might still benefit even though you're competing with foreign workers for jobs. Um, so anyway, the, the question then is, to what extent do migrant workers benefit from all of this value creation that they are adding to the Singapore economy? It's a difficult question to answer, but my suspicion is they don't benefit a lot other than the wages they get. And the reason why it's difficult for them to, to capture these benefits is there's a very high elasticity of labor supply, meaning that uh, for every worker in Singapore, every foreign worker in Singapore, you know, there are dozens of these guys back home who want to get the job in Singapore. And that makes it uh, very easy to replace them. So they don't have a lot of uh, bargaining power. I think we all know that, right? That's a problem. Okay, so what's the role of market failure or structure in explaining or addressing some of this? Um, and, and the reason why I'm going to go through this is I want to think about the fact that we might have a certain pie or economic value add from migrant labor. And I want to think about all the things which could be draining away or wasting some of that pie. Because if we can cut it, then there's a chance that uh, we can actually divert more of it to their wages, living conditions, whatever. Okay, so what are the issues? We know that source country migration markets are just terrible. High recruitment fees, people don't know what they're getting into when they move to Singapore, people take on lots of debt, so they are stuck once they get here. Okay, so that's a big problem. In Singapore, uh, there is a fairly complex contracting and subcontracting market for many industries. And that's a problem because a lot of work uh, employers may have poor economies of scale. Um, it's also difficult to monitor all of them. I think the other speakers have talked a bit about the quality differences and 
uh, the difficulty employers have in meeting the standards, uh, there's a lot of low-cost competition and cheap sourcing in these industries as well. And I think uh, taking a step back, my suspicion is there are some structural or policy factors that make it difficult for these markets to consolidate more and improve economies of scale. So all this has to be looked at. Uh, when it comes to the markets serving migrant workers in Singapore, I think there also needs to be some attention paid to whether the markets, for example, for purpose-built dormitories are sufficiently competitive. Are they delivering uh, the correct prices and the right uh, value for money. I don't have any insight into this, but I think it needs to be looked at. And we also need to look a bit at the role of policy framework. Um, in general, we have an employer responsibility framework for migrant labor in Singapore. As Jeremy mentioned earlier, employers have to ensure lodging healthcare welfare for the duration of their stay. And this is in contrast to local labor, where the employer is limited to a much more uh, basic set of issues in the Employment Act. And what this means is, a lot of the value generated by migrant workers is retained by the employer and is converted to benefits, but this provision of benefits is uneven. Uh, in local labor, it's a lot different, right? The government is actually a lot more responsible for subsidized provision. So real question here about employ whether employers are able to fulfill these responsibilities properly. And employers also have been given market power through the work permit system. And that's actually also a bit of an issue. Okay, so what are some tentative next steps? I think uh, if we want to start trying to solve this problem, besides all of the good work that's going on on the ground today, in the medium term, you want to think about whether we can solve some of these market failures and asking ourselves whether the policy design is actually fit for purpose. And again, the more uh, waste we can cut away from the pie, the more of it we can potentially repurpose for wages or living conditions. But we have to be aware people want to work in Singapore and cost of living in Singapore are high. So some of these gains could be competed away. It's not clear you end up with a better situation. Okay, and I think uh, as a policy maker, you have to think about implementing a fairly high floor or minimum for working and living conditions. Uh, without that, because of the competition issue, the improvements are not going to get retained. But when you put in a high floor, we also have to face up to the fact that uh, some kinds of migrant labor industries may not be economically viable in Singapore. That's obviously bad for the workers who are in the industry, but it also uh, has some effects for Singaporeans as well, because the quality of the standard of services that you get today may be different. Okay, So I think that's it for my presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Walter. Uh, I also have today uh, three uh, discussants who provide their thoughts. Uh, Professor Pauline Strawn, uh, Dean of Students and Professor of Sociology at Singapore Management University. Uh, she's also a medical sociologist and works on issues to do with infections. Um, we also have a professor, Associate Professor Eugene Tan from School of Law, Singapore Management University. Recently wrote an op-ed on uh, I mean, this whole issue of migrant labor. Uh, also, um, Mr. Leonard, Leonard Lim, uh, Country Director of Ryan's and Partner, and partners is a consulting firm that, and, and uh, Lena will be able to give us a good perspective of employers. All right, so we have uh, three panelists. I'll, I'll start off with Pauline, then uh, Eugene, and then Leonard. Just uh, uh, fire accordingly in your thoughts, and then later on we'll have a good uh, discussion among the speakers and the panelists. Pauline, over to you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, this is such a difficult topic because I think for many Singaporeans, this is not an issue that suddenly jumped out at us. I mean, we've lived with this um, and we've, you know, I don't know whether it, I agree with Jeremy that you know, our mental model is one where it is us and them and then we render, you know, the foreign, the migrant worker portion invisible. Um, but let me just get to, you know, the, the the issues that I think bother me most. And I think um, if I may uh, direct my attention to uh, Jeremy's sharing, I hear from Jeremy that policies are adequate. Huh? I hear from Jeremy that uh, Ministry of Manpower as a policing unit have done due diligence. Um, so the problem seems to be concentrated at that translational level, and that is uh, dorm operators, right, and in the crisis that we are facing now. But Jeremy also said that um, the care model that we now have in place for our foreign workers who are ill um, is based on this mental model, which he has, he has described, you know, as the 
a two system, you know, two people's model. I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with it. Um, so, so the question I have for Jeremy really is, um, if this is a clinical, clinically reasonable model where treatment is contained within the dorms, because most of our foreign workers who are ill at this point have fairly mild symptoms, um, then my question would be, if we don't do it this way, what are the other options that we have? Is there a better way of dealing with it, right, without um, stressing out our healthcare system? But most important for me would be if there should be a spike in deterioration, right, of the well-being of the mildly um, affected foreign workers at this point, will our healthcare system be able to manage um, to roll out critical care for so many people? And if not, then what 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 options do we have ahead, right? Um, then. Thinking beyond COVID, uh, I think the critical question I have would be, under normal circumstance, how do we care for our migrant workers? Um, do, we, do they receive adequate medical care, just like a Singaporean would, um, in terms of their mental well-being, given the kind of stresses and uh, constrained environment they live in? Are they taken care of? how do we then break this barrier where they are afraid to report um, illnesses and, and periods of ill health for fear of um, repercussions from, from their employers? Are there solutions that we have to ensure that post-COVID, we will not you know, see a similar crisis amongst our foreign workers, our migrant workers? And then, of course, the larger issue that I have um, the concern, of course, is now we know that we rely on, on, on foreign workers. Um, you know, Walter's presentation, uh, I don't think there would be anyone in the audience who would argue that we don't need them. Let's cut back on them, right? And let's just, you know, um, re realign and reject, you know, our, our labor force distribution. So then the question would be, is there a better way of of improving on the well-being of our foreign workers, um, clearly the implications would be on costs, right? Uh, so, so then it becomes a community, you know, question: Are we are we willing to bear a higher cost so that our foreign, our migrant workers will have a better life in Singapore? Right? I think that's a question that all Singaporeans have to answer. Then. Uh, and I'll, I'll end with the, uh, the, the last observation, and that is. We, we now, you know, are acutely aware of the um, difficult living conditions of our foreign workers. But being aware and wanting to do something, there are two different constructs altogether. Um, many of us will say and agree that, oh, you know, we should treat them better, we should house them better, we should have them in, you know, better locations, you know, we should treat them like one of us. However, when alternative housing springs up in your neighborhood, right, in our neighborhood, immediately, you know, a different response comes up. Oh, sh no, surely not in my neighborhood because, and then there's a whole string of, of uh, I, I won't say excuses, you know, but fears, right? Um, so, so I fairly recently, I happened to see Christopher D'Souza, who is my MP, uh, his Facebook. Right? <laughs> he put a very nice positive picture on Nexus uh, International School. And he said, oh, this is great. You know, this, this is a very good uh, alternative as temporary housing for foreign workers who are well. Right? And we welcome them to the neighborhood. You should see the comments on his Facebook. You know, from worried, worried residents, um, uh, polite but worried, right? And, and, and listing their concerns that they are older, you know, residents, they worry for their safety, they worry for, um, you know, mainly security issues and so forth. So I, I, I think that it's very important you know, when all of us are on these platforms for discussions that. Uh, concurrently, while we raise to consciousness the concerns that we have, and, and you know, inequality jars all of us, and all of us want to, you know, fight for fight for better conditions for for our foreign friends. Um, and and I'm very sure that you know I speak for everyone here in this in this on this platform that that we are really sorry that they've gone through such a difficult time. 
right? And they're still going through such a difficult time, right? Um, but what can we do uh, as a community? I think that this is an important question that we have to we have to we have to re re resolve before we can see real improvement in the plight, you know, of these amazing people who have come to build our country with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, now over to you, uh, Professor Eugene Tan. Eugene, we can't so, hear you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you, thank you, Matthew, and and uh, and and I want to commend the, the speakers for their uh, presentations. Um, I I just would want to to ask the speakers to consider, you know, given the issues that they've raised, um, you know, what do they manifest? I mean, what symptoms? These issues that you have, that, that that you have you have highlighted, you know, what do they? What symptoms are, are, are they a manifestation of? Um, my sense is, I think we, you know, we are addicted uh, not just to cheap labor. Uh, we are also addicted to cheap but and transient labor. Um, so the, I, the the fact that you know that there is this revolving door and that workers come and go, um, and which puts us in, in 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 us meaning the employers and the government in, in a very significant bargaining position. Um, and and I think it also reflects an, another issue, which is you know. That we, are, that we want to enjoy the benefits of uh, having a massive uh, foreign uh, cheap labor. Uh, but as a society, uh, you know, we, are, we are not prepared uh, you know, to, to bear the cost. Um, and in a way, um, you know, for not being prepared to bear the cost in, in the past, uh, we are now in, in, in effect uh, paying the price uh, for, for the neglect uh, you know, that, that has taken place. Um, so I, I suppose, you know, the, the, the question then here is, you know, when, when you look at the debate that's been going on, uh, I, I wonder whether the, the, the speakers take the view that uh, there's been too much focus on the value uh, that foreign workers bring to the Singapore economy. Um, I, I think it's important to talk about value, but I, I think what's missing from the equation is the issue of values, right? So, so and, and that results in in, in my view, you know, to, to the extent that uh, I think the foreign workers here are not afforded, uh, you know, that basic dignity, um, you know, that, that everyone who's striving to work uh, ought, ought to have. Um, and and so, so, you know, when I was looking at the um, parliament debate on Monday, um, you know, I, I, I was rather concerned, you know, that, that uh, again, economic value, right? You know, whether employers are prepared to pay more for dorm accommodation, uh, was really the, the, the driving message from, uh, from the government. Um, but what about things like doing what's right? Uh, you know, because if this is the way we could treat our foreign workers, um, I think there's nothing to say that uh, that sort of treatment could extend uh, to another marginalized group in Singapore, you know, whether they are citizens um, or not. Um, so so I, I, I suppose I just want to, to end with, uh, you know, a question for, uh, you know, for all the speakers. Uh, really is, you know, I, I know we are, we are still in early days, um, you know, but what is the current approach, you know, that the government has taken, uh, you know, the employers, the dorm operators, uh, what do they tell us about the lessons that have been learned? Uh, maybe that's, that's, that's the easy one, but what about the lessons that, that we have not learned, uh, as well as the lessons that we are not prepared to learn? Thank you. Thanks very much, Eugene. Uh, and now let's have Leonard. Leonard, could you provide some of your thoughts? Thanks. Um, thanks, Matthew. Thanks, IPS, and thank you to the panelists for sharing your useful thoughts on this very important issue. Um, as Matthew said, so I work in a public consulting firm, public policy consulting firm, and we do work for MNCs. And I think in the past few weeks, uh, the feedback from these MNCs has been that yes, something does need to be done about the whole foreign worker situation in Singapore. But the trouble is that I think the incentives for Status quo, to, status quo to continue are still there. So for example, these MNCs, they locate themselves in Singapore because of the low corporate tax situation. Um, we have actually, if you think about it, pretty low costs for businesses, even though we are a first world country. So it's still a very attractive destination uh, for businesses. Um, so looking ahead, I think, what are the policy changes going forward? 
um, we do have to think about the social compact and the economic compact that Singapore is built on. And I think in that regard, Walter's um, graphics of how much the dependence on foreign labor has changed over the years was very useful. Um, so I think we do have to, um, as the previous discussions, discussions have also talked about it, think about the cost if we do switch uh, to a lesser reliance or smaller reliance on foreign labor. Um, the, the big thing, for example, would be greater business cost. Um, transport, public transport infrastructure will take a longer time to build, for instance, if we have less foreign workers. Uh, public flats, HDB flats, will take a longer time to build. So can Singapore couples take a, a wait a little longer for flats to come on stream? And um, I think like the previous discussion talked about, especially Eugene talked about the community, uh, I think it was Pauline. But to me, I think the government does have an important role to play in this whole process. I mean, as we all know, the government has a larger than life role in Singapore. Um, they take the lead on, once they take the lead on something, everyone just falls into line. So I think on this issue, actually, the government does have an important signaling uh, role to play in terms of whether it's legislation or messaging on treating foreign workers better and changing the entire uh, social and economic compact of Singapore. So I'll just end with just one question for the panelists and particularly for Walter, I guess, because it, excuse me, jumps off from your presentation. I'm curious to think how hopeful are you um, of substantial change from the government uh, on this front in terms of dependence on foreign labor, particularly taking into account the fact that a lot of our uh, economy now is highly reliant on foreign labor. So for example, could we wait a little bit longer for new MRT lines to come on stream? Once you consider all this, then I think it's a challenging question. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leonard. All right, uh, we've got some time. Uh, I mean, for all those of you who are planning to leave at five o'clock, just uh, take note, we definitely are going to all run the session. And uh, I think we have very, very good ideas and questions and comments. So I hope you stay on for, and I hope all our speakers and panelists are happy to hold on for a little longer as we kind of go through, there are a lot of questions coming, so I'd like to clear some of them. Uh, let's start with, uh, I mean, uh, Jeremy, since uh, Prof. Sean has leveled a couple of questions to you, uh, specifically <laughs> yes. what your thoughts of it, and after that we'll follow with. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah. First, maybe we should really make, make the point very clear that the migrant work, that the dormitory and the, the dormitories, the migrant workers are being isolated and quarantined, not for their own safety. They are being isolated for the safety of the rest of us, right? And, and all the economic hardship, the challenges with remittances and so on are entirely to serve the, the broader Singapore community. And this is a debt that I think it is clear that we do owe them. Frankly, the simplest thing from a migrant worker point of view to do is just carry on life as, as per normal because the vast majority, as we have learned, are clinically very, very well. I don't agree with Pauline that it's not evident that we have a two-tier system. I mean, uh, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's the portability of the, of the work permits, we accept that these low-income migrant workers have a different set of uh, really paradigms that they live with compared to the rest of us. And this percolates through not just the, and, it's, and it goes way beyond healthcare. And this is driven by the notion that we and this is driven by the different mental models that citizens have certain rights and, and really privileges as citizens rather than as human beings. And I guess um, uh, this is a challenge that we really ought to really confront. On the questions around the dormitories and all the, the fundamental issue is really one of resilience because the migrant workers come to Singapore for economic maximization. So, in, in, in many instances, we have to protect the workers from really themselves. They would squeeze into crowded quarters because it helps them to save money. And I'm sure many of us, when we were young and poor university students, the, really, the, the hotel would have rules maximum of three persons and seven persons would squeeze in, right? But the hotels have these rules for really very valid reasons, fire and safety, but we live with it, right? because we don't expect there to be a fire. And in the same way, the migrant worker, the dorm operator, the employers live with, this, with these congested situations because it's about economic maximization. But how do we protect themselves and how do we protect all of us from these, con from these conditions that don't have the resilience that COVID-19 is clearly demonstrating to all of us? 
And I think uh, if I can just end off by taking Eugene's question on the lessons that we have learned, I think we have learned that we are one community and our international reputation, how our citizens look at ourselves, look at our political leadership, is really a function of how we treat every last human being. And I certainly hope that the lessons that we learn moving forward is to really get back to the core, to talk about the values that Eugene mentioned and what are the values that will make Singapore and what are the sort and what's the sort of Singapore that we want to grow old, that we want our our children to live and to grow up in. And I suspect that once we have gotten this clear, the the how we think about migrant workers, it will it, it will also become much more clarified. Thank you. And back to you, Matthew. Thanks. Uh I mean I, I, I'll let I mean uh, Bernard speak first and then after that uh Walter, and then after that, uh, in case any of the discussions free fall. want to jump in. Yeah, free for all. Whether <laughs> they're happy with your answer, Jeremy. <laughs> Bernard, any, any thoughts from... You could unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I think I also want to carry on from where Jeremy left off. Um, actually, I'm very happy that Pauline mentioned um, this uh, not in my backyard uh, a thing. Um, I've, I've actually worked in the migrant worker field now almost 20 years, uh, advocating from everything for everything from housing standards to electronic payment of salaries to, you know, uh, recruiting uh, workers by quality rather than quantity uh, uh, and the benefits of that. Um, so, yes, I know there are a lot of conversations and I think three quarters of the panelists are academics. So, you know, on the economic costs, the employer's responsibilities, you know, who bears these costs. Um, but I just want to take a bit of time to echo, you know, what some of the speakers have already said about the, the non-monetary costs and um, the social compact and the, the type of community we're trying to build for ourselves. Um, so I, I, I've also found uh, in the aftermath or actually during the occurrence of uh, certain key events in the past that involved migrant workers, uh, namely the SMRT strike and the Little India riot. And, um, there would often be a surge in uh, online and public discourse. Um, we would have a lot of people coming out and saying, you know, we should do this and we should improve that and we should, you know, more of this and less of that. And, you know, um, and in every crisis, it's always been my hope that when we do eventually come out of this, these conversations continue and they, they persist. But uh, unfortunately, though, you can, you can obviously, very, very obviously tell that there's been an increase, a gradual increase over time of concern and interest and wanting to know and wanting to learn and wanting to get involved uh, over time. But I think it's lagged behind my expectations. Uh, that I, I've had during these crises. Um, so I, I was just uh, drafting a response to one of the media groups that made a query the other day. And I remember that, you know, I, you know the, the whole thing I drafted was about housing standards and what has the history been, what has been advocated for in the past and how does this translate to what we're going to do after we learn lessons from COVID-19. Then ultimately, I also thought, yeah, actually, it all comes down to basically bringing all the stakeholders. And I, when I say all the stakeholders, I mean even ordinary Singaporeans. I think we need, a, we need a platform where we can bring employers, dormitory operators, government officials, NGO uh, activists, and even ordinary members of the community together um, to very honestly and openly examine our consciences. You know, um, you know am I a housing advocate only during COVID-19 and not outside of it, you know, um, that kind of a situation. And I think if we want to build the kind of society where we are grateful to the people that um, transit or not come and help us uh, add on to the Singapore story, uh, I think there must come a time where we, we question ourselves. Um, you know, is this us versus them mentality, right? Uh, obviously, during this period, nobody would agree with that. But, um, 
you know, you already see a little bit of the beginnings of what Pauline had mentioned in the past. Um, we are now relocating some of these workers from the big dorms into the heartland areas. And like Pauline mentioned, we already are getting, you know, we're more or less reverting to that old frame of mind a little bit also. Um, some of these people may have been the people that have come forward and given money and, uh, you know, uh, uh, donated uh, uh, items in kind and, and, and tried to volunteer and help. Um, so I, I do believe, like what Jeremy says, you know, it's a bit of a mindset issue. It's just that we tend to be a little bit, I think, Singaporeans sometimes may have the possibility of being a little bit fickle and a little bit uh, self-serving in, in, in how they approach the situation. And I think we have to depart from that kind of thinking. Uh, if we really want to create the kind of society that, you know, I think we all would prefer to have, um, and one in which, uh, you, you, you know, migrant workers don't need activists or the government or, uh, uh, you know, some proxy to uh, uh, assert their rights and their, 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 their entitlements, uh, where, you know, vast sections of our society just simply reject that these practices should be uh, should be in play, you know. Um, so that's that's my point of view uh, as a practitioner on the ground. Thank you. Thanks, Bennett. Uh, Walter, any of your thoughts? Yeah, let me just um, let me just follow on actually from what uh, Bernard and, and Jeremy are saying as well. You know, I, I think. Um, I, I recognize the point that uh, every time a crisis happens or something flares up, we talk a lot about what we need to do and in the end actually change sometimes doesn't happen to the extent that we hope it would have. Um, but I think, you know, it's pretty clear the reason why it doesn't happen so thoroughly is because it's actually in our own economic self-interest for the average, you know, Singaporean for there not to be substantial change in the way that migrant workers are treated, or indeed the way anybody who is uh, worse off than us in Singapore is actually treated. I mean, that's the unfortunate reality of it. I mean, you, in some way, you can't expect, you know, the average Singaporean to do something against their economic self-interest in this area any more than you could expect a, a white American, you know, before the civil war to uh, voluntarily abolish slavery, right? I mean, I know the comparison is vastly overblown, but the point is you have quite a large group in society in Singapore who benefits whether they like it or not. You know, they might, they, they might not be taking part at all in the... Um, you know, in the bad treatment of migrant workers, but by the existence in a society which benefits from low-cost labor, you are actually benefiting to some extent, right? And so because of that, it's just not really in your self-interest to actually get too worked up about it. Um, so I think that's the basic problem you have to overcome, right? How as a society do you decide to do something because it is right to do, even though it is going to be painful to you and the people you care about, right? That, that's actually the, the challenge here. Because I think we do have an ethical duty to treat other people in Singapore as we would want to be treated. And I think that means trying to figure out what are a set of common standards that, you know, apply to migrant workers as well as the Singaporean workers. And I think if you look at the industry in Singapore, you know, in some areas, I don't think we are that far apart. When it comes to things like uh, safety standards and so on, I mean, um, we, I think we have done a lot of work there, although there are still troubling areas and so on. I mean, that's something which is, I think, on a bit safer ground. When it comes to the living standard problem, I think the problem really is, are the standards fit for purpose? And are the standards the same that would prevail to Singaporean workers if they were in the same conditions? Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that, for example, migrant workers should have the same housing if it should be housing. What it means is that if Singaporeans were also in worker dormitories for an extended period of time, we might have a certain idea about the kind of standards that should apply to Singaporeans. And therefore, the same idea should apply to, you know, foreign workers in those standards as well. It should be the same kind of uh, ish standard. Um, wages, honestly, that's much more tricky because I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll recognize the whole point of having migrant workers is so that we can pay them less than we would have to pay if we only got Singaporeans. So I think that's something that has to be worked on actually over a longer period of time. But that is also something that you have to think about. Um, will we see substantial change? Um, you know, it's, 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 
normal to frame this as, oh, I want the government to go and do something about this. Reality is, government does what it thinks the public is willing to support, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, occasionally you can rely on a government to do something, uh, you know, that, that the public doesn't exactly support because the government believes it's right or necessary, but a lot of the time, government reflects the popular will. So I think we need some expression of the popular will in this area in order for there to be structural change that the government actually embarks on. But I think there is some hope because we are facing a confluence of events brought about by COVID-19, which may cause us to rethink why we need so many migrant workers uh, in the particular structure that we have here in Singapore, right? Uh, what I mean by that is, I think we're facing a real threat in Singapore to the high population model for growth. Uh, you know, for, for I think two broad sets of reasons. One is that, um, you know, I think we're seeing that having a high population concentrated in the area actually reduces resilience to some extent because of all of these supply chain vulnerabilities, uh, coping with medical, you know, disease outbreaks and so on. So that's something to worry about a bit. I think the other aspect is the benefit from concentration uh, is actually getting eroded very rapidly, right? Because of, for example, remote working. Uh, you have a lot of people concentrated traditionally in a big city because there's a lot of economic benefit from that. But you know, the more you can get away with remote working, the more some of your workers are going to say, why, am I, why do I have to be in Singapore? I could, you know, be in Cincinnati and do the same job. So from the expatriate's point of view, why send people here expensively when they're doing the same job from wherever they are and they just remote into their colleagues in Singapore? So um, population, you know, and therefore the need to have so many foreign workers to service them, that might actually come under some serious questioning. And when you combine it with the fact that uh, demand in some industries might be suppressed for quite some time, there might be this opportunity to restructure a bit. So I think uh, let's see what happens. But honestly, none of us really know how in the next few months is going to play out. Yeah, but I think that I think overall, you know, in closing, just my, my main point is um, all of us, I think, have some individual and collective responsibility to do something about it. We can't just say it's a government problem or an evil employer problem. Uh, and there needs to be, I think, that popular will uh, and a rejection of this kind of trickle up economics model we have where we expect all these uh, lowly paid masses to serve us, that has to, I think, go away a bit. Otherwise, we are not going to get substantial change. Yeah. Thank you very much, Walter. Uh, I, I mean, really appreciate the panelists' uh, discussions providing some very, very important ideas. In fact, I, I've been looking at all the questions that have been coming in, uh, quite a few questions. And uh, in, in some way or another, I do think that the panelists and discussions have raised some of those things and have, uh, I mean, discussed it in some part. Uh, really appreciate all the questions because I think it's something that we can begin to, at the Institute, begin to work on and start uh, providing some thoughts about that. And I think so. That all, all these questions would be much, much uh, useful. But one of the themes that I think uh, coming out from the questions, um, uh, I see one from Victor Mills, who is, I think, uh, President and CEO at Singapore International Chamber of Commerce, right? Uh, and he says this, what more, I mean, essentially the question about what does a panel think that a private sector should do after the current COVID-19 crisis in respect of the employing and housing of migrant workers? The subtext, subtext here is that there is too much reliance on government intervention and too little acceptance and responsibility by the employers. Uh, then you've got others like Hernik asking about, uh, I mean, if uh, there have been... Uh, Mrs. Josephine Theo has already stated in Parliament that uh, there, there have been quite a few violations in, in dormitories. So what's going on there? I mean, the, the private sector doesn't seem to care. Does it require the government to use very stringent rules and regulations? Will that be the only measure we have in Singapore? Or on the other hand, like what Victor is saying, can the uh, private sector own some of these issues uh, and take it forward? Uh, just any broad thoughts of anyone, the panel, if you... Maybe I'll just start the ball rolling. I think it is, uh, it is usually ethically very uh, accepted that society has a moral duty to look after vulnerable populations. And the migrant worker population is a vulnerable one, as we have heard, by essentially policy design. So if we have made them vulnerable, then what is the duty of care that we owe to ensure that that, that there are minimum standards. And here, I am, to be honest, skeptical about the role of the 
private sector because the the private sector by its nature has to balance the books it has to be about revenue and and really margin optimization and as long as it's it is legal then i think it is unrealistic to expect the private sector to do more unless there is substantial public pressure as we see with say uh, ethical farming and and uh, and the clothing and so on but i do suspect that the migrant worker is so far removed from the from the from the end buyer and the issues are so complex that the government has to and and i'm no fan of big government and let me just state so up front but i do think this is one instance where the government has to show moral leadership and essentially either directly or or through some of the government linked companies lead the way back to you matthew Anybody else on the panel have any thoughts on that? I think this is an overarching thought. So Eugene wanted to say something. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it, it, I echo what Jeremy and, and Leonard said, said earlier. Uh, I think the government must take the lead um, and, and because I think it, it, it will have that important signaling effect. Uh, I think so long as, you know, the question when I heard that, you know, there have been all these transgressions, uh, 1,200 dong operators fined, um, you know, then the question is, look, then what's happening? You know, is it because your enforcement is not, not strong enough or the measures are not strict enough? Um, everyone's been asking, you know, um, who is the commissioner for uh, foreign employee dorm dormitories, right? Um, and, and, and then we learned on Monday that, you know, he's, he's assisted by, by two deputies and there are like 16 assistant uh, commissioners. Um, and, and so it really makes us wonder, you know, ha have our standards dropped so low? Right, in, in terms of the DOM uh, regulations, right? Because the DOM, the, the, the purpose built DOMs were meant to signal uh, a change, you know, much as I know that the, the DOMs was, was in a way an attempt to keep the workers, uh, the foreign workers from not congregating in, in, in the public areas, right? I mean, that there is that sinister side to, to the whole uh, foreign employee DOMs, you know? Um, and so it, it goes back to, to, to the larger point, right? You know, um, you know, my concern that, you know, we probably may not learn the right lessons, uh, you know, from this episode. I mean, what we're doing now for the foreign workers is what we have to. Um, and so the constant reference to, you know, two different outbreaks is something that really worries me because it seems to perpetuate, um, you know, the mindset that, okay, you know, so long as the Singaporean community is safe, you know, it doesn't matter what happened to DOMS, you know, because they're all locked in, um, you know, and, and, and that's good for us. Um, because I think the more we continue with this mindset, um, you know, that, that, that there are two different societies, I think that's when, you know, we will, we will continue to see different manifestations of, of this foreign, uh, this COVID-19 massive infections in, in, in the dorms. Um, Matt, if I may jump in. I, I don't think, Eugene, it's fair to say that um, Singaporeans in general, you know, are happy to look at just the community spread and not, you know, care about the foreign workers uh, crisis. I, I think that the reporting is done exactly right because most important is you don't want to have mass panic in a community. That one toilet paper run was enough for me, right? Um, so I do think that we need to send, you know, a, a carefully calibrated message because at the end of the day, for us to get through this crisis, there must be hope. If there is no hope, there's going to be chaos. But coming back to you know, the foreign workers, the migrant workers situation, my plea to the patient, I'm, I'm not an economist and, and I'm certainly not an expert in this whole area at all. What I hope to get out of this panel, <laughs> this discussion when, when Matt asked me, and I said yes immediately because I wanted to hear some practical solutions. Right? I want to know, as a Singaporean, I know there's a problem, and there are many Singaporeans like me who know that there is a problem, and we don't want to let this opportunity slip away. This is a chance for us to act, and there's enough of us who care, and we want to act. But I'm still not getting, <laughs> I'm sorry to be rude about this, but you know, what can we do as a country to resolve this? I, I think that we need to arrive at you know, some action plan that is doable, sustainable, policeable, and then move forward from here. Um, yeah. So are, are, are the changes, Pauline, that you're thinking about, are they all 
fairly structural, I mean, legal changes, because that's what, I mean, I'm, I'm reading through all these different posts. Lots of people are putting out issues about that should we change things in terms of our standards, MOM regulations and all that. Let me just get Bernard to jump in because mm -hmm. he started off with this idea about uh, we all trying to do something in, in normal uh, situations, right? So Bernard, what do you think? Can we do something? Sorry, I'm not very good with this meeting and unmuting. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think I want to just go back to, I think all the speakers have mentioned it uh, in some way, shape or form, uh, to some degree. I, I, I still think it's possible. I think it's possible to bring everybody to the discussion table. Um, in, in, in some ways, yes, you know, maybe somebody has to take the lead. Uh, maybe that's the private sector, maybe that's the government, so some moral leadership, as some of the speakers have said. But I, I, rather, than, rather than get those stakeholders that are directly involved in uh, whether hiring, or housing, or regulating uh, migrant workers, I think it's, impo it's important. Uh, Walter mentioned that uh, basically how the political office holders design the policy, policies that are made are basically a manifestation of what the political uh, uh, will is of the people. So I, I, I'd like to think that, you know, over here in Singapore, we, we have a system that the people can together voice uh, their preference uh, for certain things in certain ways. And I, I'd like, well, I hope that uh, as we come out of this, I mean, right now, everybody's attention is on doing the best we can to take care of the migrant workers in the dormitories. But as we start to move out of this, um, I hope the conversation doesn't cease. Uh, I hope uh, the members of public that are now, you know, very vocal about some of their views regarding the dormitories, I, I hope that doesn't go away suddenly. Um, and I hope they continue to talk. And then, you know, possibly, when a, a discussion or a, a consultation is called, you know, I hope that people openly in, involve themselves in the, the discourse process. Because unless we, we I, in my view, unless we come up with a solution, uh, which every sector of our society is a part in arriving at, then I don't think even if we have a solution, it will be a sustainable solution over the long, long term. So getting everybody on a table and getting yeah. them to think through and also coming up with something that there's some congruence and some consensus. That's what uh, Bernard is advocating. Uh, hopefully that gets done. But I mean, there's, there's this, I mean, uh, this comes back from what earlier, I think Pauline threw out uh, this idea about the petition about not my backyard. Uh, many of the, if, if they're going to be better infrastructure for uh, migrant workers, then we have to kind of think about uh, some of them will end up in our backyard. And, uh, and uh, of course, Pauline did mention there are real fears about that, their concerns are real, and, and there some of that. Uh, so, I mean, so is this one, I mean, we obviously acknowledge there are concerns. Uh, is there, um, what's, the, what's the line that we can take here? I mean, is there a way to, uh, I mean, educate the public? It, can the public see beyond some of their current concerns and be a lot more uh, open or... Can, uh, are we not going to move very much on this? Uh, anybody, Pauline, you want to say something or somebody else? Yeah, I think that uh, we first of all have to acknowledge that, um, you know, while we're passionate and we want to do the right thing and we want to believe that everybody, you know, um, is just like us, um, we have to acknowledge that every time you congregate a large group of people in a small space, it could be migrant workers, it could be teenagers, it could be a bunch of elderly people. The point is if you congregate them in one large space, things are bound to happen, right? So, so first question would be, is that really the best way? You know, it, we talk about social integration in sociology a lot. And integration really is, is not about having these giant slaps of people, you know, that are, you know, with, living within boundaries, but they are living amongst their own kind. Integration is about spreading out, you know, our, our HDB policies, for example, where you have CMIO well mixed, right? And people are forced to, you know, know each other's names, know each other 
by you know their, their, their ideographic identity and not just that's a foreign worker or a migrant worker. So I think that might be one solution, not to have these large segregations and then put them in the middle of a housing estate and then say, deal with it. There will be problems, all right? It doesn't have to be migrant workers. It could be teenagers. There, there will be problems. And then the second, of course, I think what, I, see, I come back to Jeremy's point, right? Jeremy started off very nicely by saying that policies are adequate. And, and I do believe that because I, you know, I've, 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 I think that um, we could always do better but at this point, I think government has stepped in and wherever possible, you know, there is a law, right? So now the question is, um, I think better policing of the law, right? That, that is something that I think all of us have a part to play in. It's not just the enforcers, but it is just your, you know, everyday person living in the community. If you see something that is not right, you've got to report it. If you see that people are not treated right, whether they're migrant workers or not, you have to report it and you have to try to do something about it, right? So then I think what I would like to hear from, from this panel um, really is what the ordinary Singaporean can do. Because there's one government and there's three and a half million ordinary Singaporeans. So while government does what government is scheduled to do, I think the rest of us have a responsibility as well. So what can ordinary Singaporeans do in, you know, to to make the lives of our foreign workers, our guest workers, more palatable and make them feel more appreciated and more welcome. Thank you, Matt. Um, and maybe Matt, if I can just quickly clarify that when I when that Pauline's reference to me saying that policies are adequate, that's specific to healthcare access and coverage, uh, nothing to do with uh, living conditions and really so on, right? Uh, and on Pauline's point around what the average person can do, here, I would say other than being a decent human being, right, there is a role for, for active citizenry. If we think that the standards for dormitories, four and a half meters, uh, four and a half square, square meters of living space is way too low, then we should expect that, that Singaporeans as active citizens should be coming out to say maybe the right number is 12 or follow the German 15 or really whatever it is, but I do actually feel quite strongly that a lot of the root causes lie in the structural and the policy Im impediments to the workers having that dignity and that, and that voice. And until we can address those, we're essentially going in with both hands tied behind our backs. Uh, Leonard, you have something to add on? Or, I mean, big Paul, I mean, Jeremy is, I mean, we, we think about policy shifts here, but is there anything else that you think in terms of what Pauline was saying? Are there micro steps people can make? Yeah, I, I, I share, about what I don't share, Pauline's optimism in Singaporeans. I'm Singaporean myself and I know that a lot of Singaporeans um, only respond when the government tells them to do something. But I, I, I know of young Singaporeans, especially some of, my, some of them are colleagues also, they are very passionate about the foreign worker issue. Some are working at night to, for example, translate government materials into languages that the foreign workers will understand. Uh, so there, there is a growing group, I think, of, of passionate young Singaporeans who champion or want to drive for change in society. And I am hopeful that um, as these young Singaporeans get older and older, the, the impetus to, to really change society for the better uh, will happen. But in the meantime, I think the, the majority of Singaporeans, unfortunately, are still um, not caring enough. But hopefully things will change. Uh, I, I, I've noticed a lot of, I mean, points about, uh, and, and Leonard mentioned about young Singaporeans. Uh, I think quite a few young Singaporeans that uh, I interact with are uh, very, I mean, interested in the, the NGO space and what our NGOs do to try to collectively uh, champion some of the causes when it comes to migrant workers. I think that's one of the things that quite a few people, uh, quite a young uh, groups of uh, undergraduates, for instance, try to work on projects for and all that. Uh, so I just also brought to my mind, because quite a few questions have come in and we can try to close very quickly. It's got to do with the role of uh, the non-government organizations, NGOs, uh, in different ways to try to uh, call for change. We've got quite a few questions about that, uh, more in terms of one, uh, can, they, uh, can we ensure that migrants' voice uh, comes out well in 
uh, much of our thinking. Uh, Bernard talked about getting everybody together just now. Uh, somebody needs to represent the migrants. Well, obviously, the migrant can, uh, I mean, it's possible for the migrant to represent himself, but I mean, I think in some contexts, it can be complicated. So NGOs have normally been the voice for migrants. Um, uh, is, is there something we can do about the NGO space? Uh, anybody have any thoughts about that? Uh, Maybe if I can just very quickly chime in, because we as self serve focus on their healthcare and their medical related needs. But I would say that uh, then the analogy I would give is that we are the first aider and the first responder. But the work that the other NGOs do on living conditions, salaries, they are really addressing some of the root causes or, the, or what in public health literature we describe as the social determinants. And the work that our peers in TWC2 home and all do is equally important because beyond the uh, service orientation, then the advocacy and the putting out of quality research documents to show that there are, as Pauline said, practical ways forward. I think that's very, very important. And I'm encouraged, to be honest, uh, when HELSA started uh, almost 14 years ago, uh, we were worried that there wouldn't be a lot of public support. But what we have found over the years, and one of the university uh, dons shared, shared, really shared with us that the migrant worker cause is one of the most popular causes that the students volunteer. So I have a lot of optimism in the next generation. Though, like Leonard, I'm a bit uh, sanguine about the, about the current milieu. And I'll just stop there. Maybe, maybe I can also just add in there. I mean, our experience is, uh, you know, we've been doing 11, 12 years uh, worth of uh, work at uh, social integration and some of these issues. And I think in the beginning, a lot of the effort was on the migrant workers because I think the, the, the thinking at the time was maybe, you know, we try to ready the migrant workers to interact and, and hopefully then integrate uh, with Singaporeans. and there was maybe a, a, a thinking there that they may, in terms of interacting with Singaporeans, be a little bit efficient. But what we found over time is that that may not necessarily be true. Um, and uh, you know what we've learned, quite painful lesson is, you know, integration is a two-way street. It's a, it, it takes two hands to clap, you know. Uh, you can ready uh, migrant workers however you like, uh, but if you don't have an equal number of Singaporeans that are willing to come out of the shell, welcome them, accept them, and then uh, do this uh, integration experiment, then it's very, very, very difficult. And in, in recent years, what we found is when we tried to adjust our approach a little bit, not target everybody, but target more the youth, uh, the students in the schools and the tertiary institutions, we found that, uh, you know, like what everybody has mentioned already, they, they seem to be a lot more um, uh, ready for the message, you know, uh, a lot more enthusiastic about work like this. And when we've engaged students, um, have them volunteer for us, and we, we find that they, you know, the cause just keeps burning stronger and stronger, and they keep coming back. Um, so, I don't know, for us, given the space we're in, uh, we do most of the time with the resources we have, we do what works. And if something works, we, we just keep doing it. And uh, uh, so the result of that is in the last three years, we've engaged 20, more than 20,000 Singaporean students and youth uh, on this issue of uh, social integration and migrant worker rights, uh, a certain, a, a certain, yeah. All right, I think it's going to be 5.30 in a few moments, so I'm going to let everybody go, and I really appreciate the panelists taking time, the discussants taking time for that. Uh, there have been uh, lots of points being put out on both Facebook and live and our Q&A segment. Uh, some have called for deeper thoughts about our values, echoing what I think Jeremy has mentioned, others in the panel have mentioned, uh, how we think about this whole migrant issue. And of course, in the other part about uh, how we can uh, get into this collaborative space of being able to uh, sit together, talk about issues, change some perspectives which need to be changed uh, if as a whole society, we're going to be moving forward uh, in this space. I'm going to end by just mentioning that we also collected some uh, quick polls using our OP system. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, this is not a representative sample, so please don't get me wrong about that. But we asked people uh, who were coming in some, a bunch of questions. And the statement we had the most common ground uh, goes like this. There must be more enforcement 
to prevent employers from penalizing migrant workers who seek medical attention. Nearly everybody was, uh, uh, I mean, agreed with that. So I think people are quite. Uh, the other part, which was, uh, we didn't have. Uh, uh, we had quite a bit of. Uh, I mean, I would say it was. Say it's a divisive statement, but the current measures to curb infections among migrant workers are sufficient. So how? I mean. About seventy percent, thirty percent, thirty-five percent say it is, and forty-four percent say it's not, and quite a few people are undecided. Uh, we've got, I mean, uh, quite a few things. I mean, in our survey, a lot of people are undecided about some of those issues. So uh, this clearly is a topic that people are still thinking about, trying to uh, form good ideas about it. I'm very, very thankful for all the panelists and discussants who provided some additional ideas about this for all those who are. Uh, part of this listening now or later on when you see the uh, the, the recorded clip. Thank you. Uh, and uh, hopefully as you have your questions coming and you continue to provide some of your thoughts on the, the OP platform, we're trying to collect more and more insights. I think that will provide us a good set of ideas that we can feed back and put into a good report. So appreciate all of you for taking time. And uh, I think that's the end of today's session. We can't have everybody clap for the panelists, but uh, <laughs> so on behalf, thank you very much, panelists, and I'm sure uh, all our uh, all those who participated are really appreciative of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks, Matthew.